What's up, kin folk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Thank you for downloading, viewing the number one ranked show. And today, I want to talk about quarterbacks, in particular quarterback derbies. I want to drop some list on you, including my top five breakout candidate for 2021 and your takes in our we out you about, well, a tweet that I put out before the world totally changed in which I said Nebraska and Arkansas would have more fun in the Big 12. And you know what? That part has not changed and neither, I'm sure, have your opinions. But first, so WVLT, a station in Knoxville, Tennessee, published a story I found appalling. Quote, Nearly 40% of Americans think they are fit enough to be an Olympic athlete, according to a new study. One poll, that is the name of the firm that does the polling, surveyed 1,000 U.S. residents to see if they believed they had what it takes to compete in the Olympics. Two in five people thought they could keep up. According to the survey, 40% think they're fit enough to compete in at least one summer or winter Olympic sport today. Of those, 60% were women and 70% were under the age of 35. The most common sports respondents said they could compete in were basketball, soccer, and swimming. Only people who don't work out regularly believe they could be Olympians, okay? The hubris required when watching someone who is in the top 1% of their thing be casual in that thing is how we end up with such a large percentage, 40% of people with the audacity to suggest they could do the same. All you have to do is swim a lap to know you're not going to make an Olympic swimming team. But when you watch Katie Ledecky lap the field in a mile swim, you get dumb enough to say, I can do that. No fool, you can't. Appreciate that she is better at her job than most are at theirs. The point I'm making here is that being an Olympian is not about want to. We all want to. Being an Olympian is about innate talent. Most folks ain't got it. If they did, guess what they'd be doing? Exactly. The same rules apply for becoming an Olympian for playing college football, let alone college football on scholarship, let alone FBS college football on scholarship, let alone big time college football on scholarship, let alone big time college football on scholarship to play quarterback. As Meek taught us, it's brackets, bruh. These, co the, these coaches, they're not checking for you because you are not in that bracket, bruh. Learn life. It's levels to this young boy. Look, what I'm saying is, Every player recruited to play Power 5 football is the best player to come out of his neighborhood, out of his district, in a generation. These men are not regular. Trevor Knight's mom once told me he was doing backhand stands when he was a toddler. Blake Bell's mama told me she walked around with his birth certificate in her purse because other parents would accuse the boy of being a teenager as a nine-year-old playing Little League. So when we're talking about QB derbies, especially at programs expected to compete for the national title this season, it's important to recognize there isn't a bad option. There's only the best option. For instance, at LSU, Max Johnson, the quarterback who started his first game on the road on a team with a losing record and the son of a Super Bowl winning quarterback, led the Tigers to a swamp stomping of the number seven ranked Florida Gators who had a Heisman frontrunner at quarterback and two pass catchers out in routes who were drafted in the first round of the 2021 NFL Draft, including a unanimous All-American at tight end. And Johnson has been named the starter mostly by default. Miles Brennan was in competition with Johnson to start for the Bayou Bengals this season when he suffered an injury. Again, Johnson is not a bad option. At Ampersand U. Jimbo Fisher is down to Haynes King and Zach Calzada. During his junior season, King led the Longview Lobos to a 16-0 record that ended with a 6A title. As a senior, he threw for 1,926 yards and 20 passing touchdowns while rushing for 550 yards and 10 scores. He's also a 50-point 400-meter man in high school. He finished his career with the Lobos posting a 37-2 record as a starter. Calzada was an Under Armour All-American at Lanier High in Sugar Hill, Georgia. As a senior, he completed 122 of 240 pass attempts with 14 touchdowns. He ended his prep career completing 238 for 467, 
Uh, four, yeah, 3,400, 29 yards, 29 touchdowns. The dude is good. Like, that's what I'm getting at. In keeping with this thing, there's not a bad option in College Station and Ohio State. The quarterback most likely to win the job, or most unlikely to win the job, I should say, Quinn Ewers, is the highest rated signing in Ohio State history. And the other five star on the depth chart is likely to begin the season third string. Means Ryan Day is going to choose between Jack Miller the third, a man who holds Arizona State records for passing yards, passing touchdowns, and touchdowns in a season, and the 2019 Elite 11 MVP, C.J. Stroud. How good is Stroud? In February 2019, he was ranked 860th in the country. By August 20th, he was ranked number 42. And by the way, he was the last quarterback invited to the Elite 11 final. So no matter who the starter turns out to be at Ohio State or Texas A&M, he's one of the best college football players on the planet. That should make it much easier to take when C.J. Stroud and Haynes King win those respective jobs as the starting quarterbacks of national title contenders. So I'm here now with Kansas Jayhawks head coach Lance Leipold. Coach, how you doing? Doing well, RJ. Great to be with you. Well, Coach, I, uh, I had some questions for you that I wanted to start with. And the first one is, how does it feel to be just one of two head coaches in the Big 12 who has won a national championship as a head coach? <laughs> well, I, I, I did not know that. And uh, obviously that was kind of in another lifetime and, and another uh, you know level of football. And it's, it's just exciting to be in this conference and, and to be at this level and, and have an opportunity to, to take on a challenge that, that I'm really excited about. And, and I know timing and things are what, what they were and, and getting here, but uh, I, I really, I really feel it, it kind of fits uh who I am and, and what our staff's about and what we want to get accomplished. So I, I need to ask then, since you didn't know that you were one of just two head coaches to have won a national championship before heading into the Big 12, how's it feel to be in an in-state rivalry with the other guy that has won a <laughs> national championship as a head coach? Well, you know, uh, I've never worked with Chris Kleiman, and but I know I know a lot about him, and we, we've got a lot of mutual friends. Some of the guys on his staff, I've – I've had a chance to work with in the past and kind of being in the, the middle part of the country, we, we kind of intersect in a lot of ways there and have great respect. And, and I think a lot of the things that you're kind of referring to, uh, um, what we did at Wisconsin Whitewater, uh, he did at uh, North Dakota State after taking over for Craig Bowl. Scott Fuchs, our offensive line coach here at Kansas, uh, worked with him and, and was part of, of that run as well. So again, when you have great culture and, and build traditions like those two programs, both of us want to carry that on in, into the programs we now, now lead. I would be remiss if I didn't say that Coach Leipold is 146 and 39 all time as a head coach. He's 34 and one in the tournament. That is to play for Division Three championship, two and one in bowl games. Coach, how do you come to Kansas with that sort of resume? Look at Kansas and say, "Hey, I'm the guy that is ready to flip this program." For a lot of folks that. And this is coming from a Kansas fan that I asked this from. They think it's toxic. They think that your bet on this personally says a lot about what you think you're capable of and whether or not Kansas is the place for you to be to test that knowledge. Yeah, I, I think it just goes back to the challenge we took at Buffalo and there's some of the similarities there at, at maybe the group of five level of, of a program that struggled some didn't have a lot of tradition. I mean, this program has been one that over the last decade has, has really um, struggled with stability. And I, I look at that as the forefront. You look at the Mark Mangino years and his success and everybody looks to that, even some of Glenn Mason's success. And then, and then from Coach Mangino's time, it's been no, uh, a lot of turnover, not just at head coaching, it's been an athletic director, it's been assistant coaches. And the thing that I look at the, you know, the nucleus of our staff and the guys that I've worked with and I truly believe in and what we've been able to do, we haven't been those type of people that have looked, uh, moved on to a lot of jobs. We believe, believe in building, seeing recruiting classes matriculate through and all those things that can help build a program for the long term. And that's why we thought it was such a good fit. We're used to seeing coaches take jobs in January of each and every year because that's when we see the marketplace decide, hey, we're going to hire a new guy after perhaps the other guy took another job or even was fired. You didn't have that. You took this job in May in the middle of a plague. 
So I got to ask you, what about Lawrence, Kansas and Kansas football convinced you that this was the job for you to have? Well, I, again, RJ, I just go back to the opportunity, maybe where it was and, and as far as the challenge, whether it would have been December, January or or late March through, through April, it's still opportunity only knocks so many times and it only comes for the right fit. And when I talk about fit, sometimes I look at our staff and myself personally, um, my wife's from Omaha, Nebraska, about three hours away. Uh, we lived there for 13 years. Um, we're Midwest people. I think that that kind of kind of fit there from the from the personal standpoint. A lot of our staffs the same way. You look at a program, and and, and really you, you mentioned Coach Clement at, at Kansas State. I, I think when you look at the great job Matt Campbell's done at Iowa State. Um, a, a program that could be looked at as lack of tradition and success for many years. It, you know, you, you've got a great blueprint there of, of, of programs that maybe haven't had a lot of success but can get it done. And I felt it really felt it, it, it was a match for who I am and the timing of my career. And what I'd like to do one more time is is to build this thing into a consistent winner. I'm not a, I'm not at the time where I'm going to be a job hopper. Never have been, like I said. And and this uh, and really, RJ, the other one that I probably didn't touch on enough is when the athletic director job opened up, and mm -hmm. Travis Goff got the job, a KU alum. When you when you have a chance to be on the ground floor with an athletic director and build it together and be on the same page and talk through things and do it, it's really important. Um, for different circumstances, um, my time at Buffalo, before I coached my fourth season, I was on athletic director number three. And, mm -hmm. and, and through a lot of things, when you're working on things and talking about projects and improvements and culture, it if, if anything, if they don't stop, they definitely hit the pause button for a while. So, so, to, so once, the, you know, Travis Goff was hired and I saw that opportunity, especially with him at being from the state of Kansas, I really was excited about what this place could be in the future. I'm glad you mentioned Travis Goff because that was going to be my follow up to this is what does it feel like for you to be going in with a brand new athletic director, being a brand new head coach? What does he say to you to convince you that, hey, your instincts are correct in that Kansas is a good job for you and your staff, right? And your family that makes you feel like, okay, cool. We can do this in Lawrence because again, everybody's got a boss and right. yours is just Travis Goff. So you have to get along with that guy. What does he say to you to convince you to get him to Lawrence? Well, of course, his experience here, you know, as a student, early part of his career, his passion for it, but understanding the fan base, the resources that, that can be available, but also that I guess realistic that it's going to take time. And, you know, it wasn't about money per se. It was about the time and, and getting a six year contract, especially with the, the timing of this was crucial that they were going to do it right and get it right this time. When you see everyone two two years, two years, or whatever, you you wonder why it's it, it it doesn't happen. Well, it's pretty pretty evident. And in this day and age of people being impatient and and these phones that are so much in the instant part of everything having to happen now, um, to see that it was a breath of fresh air. Now I'm a pretty impatient guy too, so it isn't like we're gonna sit and wait and and hope to win in year three or four. We're gonna build this thing for stability sake, but also to give us our best chances to win now. So that was probably the biggest thing, his energy and passion. And, and, and like I said, I, I think he's a guy that's going to be here a long time as well. I find this question to be a little bit just stark because the way that I'm phrasing it to you, you just wouldn't expect to have this question in August, but I'll give it to you. When did you first meet your team in person? Well, it was actually the day I flew in, which was okay. uh, April 30th, I believe. And uh, as I, you know, as things went on, um, I kind of share with you, I was like, you know, we we're going through starting some of the negotiations and it was looking like things were working out. And it was the Thursday night, the NFL draft and things weren't kind of, it was trending, but it wasn't solidified. Mm -hmm. I actually went to bed. And then I got up and, and I went to bed and, and the people represented me said, I'll let you know what's going on. But uh, 
you know, I got up pretty early though, I'll say that, but he said, yeah, Travis Goff's gonna call you at eight o'clock and officially offer you the job. And I, you know, it came at 7.45, I was on a plane by like one o'clock with my, <laughs> okay. So it was a fast life-changing moment then from that point on. But I did fly in and, and see some things. And then the team was finishing their last really walk through before the spring game. And I did get a chance they were still on the field to co go out and, and just, you know, put a face to, to my name and just say hello. And then say, we would, you know, get a chance to meet individually from there. Cause I wanted them, they deserved the right to finish spring the right way under the circumstances, which they had gone through 14 practices. I try not to be a distraction as much as it, it sometimes can be for them and the staff. Then I went to talk to the staff as well and said, you know, that, that we would talk on Sunday and that they should go out and enjoy the spring game and, and go coach and have fun and, and give those guys great experience. And then we would start moving forward from there. It's a rough place to be, I'm sure, uh, especially coming in as late as you did with spring practice basically be, having been done. You mentioned 14 practices. You only get 15 at this level. So they were very well much close, closer, uh, closing in on their spring game, and then they're going to try to figure you out. How do you ingratiate yourself with a bunch of kids that have been playing FBS football in a Power 5 conference for three, four, eight, five, even six years and haven't had a whole lot of success, uh, or excuse me, success. How do you tell them, hey, I'm going to give you everything I got. Trust me. I promise to make you a better football player, and I promise to make you a better man, and have them believe you. Right. Well, and that's, and as you know, trust is a big thing in, in, our, in our world today, and it's hard to trust because the last guy said to trust them. And I, I mean, last guy could be position coach, could be whatever, and sure. it's a tough thing. And, and like you said, and not only was it spring game, then it was finals and leaving for a few weeks. So I, I tried to get as many of the 80 plus players that were there one on one meetings hmm. in person all week. Then we did some that I did not, that, that had to leave early, did them by Zoom. And we just talked about, you know, a little bit about me, more about them and what they saw they needed in this program. And they wanted consistency. They wanted structure. They wanted some things that way. It wasn't about, hey, what scheme are you running or what? Again, they're, you know, and it's sometimes as much as we're hard on this, this age group of people, they are pretty perceptive and they know, and they know what they want and need and, and a lot of those things. And then you start talking about not just wins and losses and places that we've coached, RJ. We talked about stability that Brian Borland, our defensive coordinator, has been with me now for 15 seasons. Andy Kolnicki has been with me for nine seasons as the offensive coordinator. Other guys that I've known for 20 plus years and worked with them maybe somewhere else. And, and what I say to that is it's, it's not just a good old friends network. It's people I know, I, I trust, I know their character, I know their integrity, I know their, how they're gonna motivate them and develop them, not just as players, but as men. And uh, again, I just say, you know, you know we, we've got to learn to, trust each other along the way and and through and it takes a little time and uh we just ask that we work together the other component is like i said they went home right away mm -hmm. then they come back and you're really limited to the time that you get with them and that's where the crucial work and the really the great work of our our head strength coach matt gildersley really was a uh, uh you know so imperative for us. He does a great job instilling what we want our culture to be and culture is going to be action and what you do and how you go about it, how you conduct yourself in every facet of your life, the gratitude that you have, the giving back that we want to do to our community, but really the work ethic and how you take care of yourself each and every day. And we start with that. And, and the guys have seen, you know, bits of success. And as we go through that, they're seeing the benefits of doing it this way. And then hopefully those are going to start showing up as we as we take the field here this fall well i'm glad you you mentioned taking the field here this fall because coach i i wonder if folks in lawrence have told you how not excited they are to see chanticleers rock a doodle doing when rock chalk country last year and you get an opportunity to go back to conway and get one back that that loss that they took was to a very good football team. And I want to make that very clear. Colts Carolina was a very good football team last year. But Kansas fans play in the Big 12. And they like to think of themselves as being able to beat up on a team like Coastal Carolina. 
What do you say to Kansas fans about having an opportunity to go and win that game this year? Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity. I, I would imagine that when we go out there in week two, they're going to still be rated in the top 25 in the country. And it's, you know, so to go on the road and, and play against teams like that, um, we've played them the last two years here um, and, and come up on the short side. So we've got to find a way to get that turned. Um, what, what a story that program's had. Um, you know, is uh, coming from from Buffalo. Uh, we were scheduled to play them as well this year. So, so even as we went through the spring, we we had seen some things about, about them, and of course, know about their success. So, um, yeah, it's. I, I think our guys are excited about it, and uh, you know, knowing uh, and and the thing that's caught me though, it's some players talking about that game. They watch some things in in the early parts of that game as where they're going, and they they have to you know they gave respect and their due to to really the Coastal's way of going about things. And and you can tell they've got it running in a good way and disciplined and structured and all the things that you want. And, and, they, and they respect the success that they had last season. But again, our fan base has an expectation and, and we'll be excited for that one uh, after we take, you know, take the field the first week against South Dakota. Last question for you, Coach. And, and I gave this with some thoughts, so bear with me. Every now and then, uh, the free state of Kansas puts out an absolute football stud. Wichita, Barry Sanders comes to mind. Joseph Randall comes to mind. Of course, here recently, unanimous All-American, Brees Hall is at Iowa State. At Olathe North, in particular, the high school, Isaiah Simmons and Darren Sproles both come out of that high school. What are you doing to ensure that the next football <laughs> stud that comes out of your state ends up being a Kansas Jayhawk? Well, excellent question. And, uh, you know, we, we've tried to do that and looking at some of the, again, like a lot of people, this isn't, you know, earth shattering, changing news, what we're doing. We're going to put more people in, in, in this area recruiting, um, whether it be in the state of Kansas alone or, or right across the border. We have to do a better job in, in a four hour radius and, and to the west, all the way through the western part of Kansas. Um, there's just not enough players on this roster right now. Um, you know, from this state, and, and we've acknowledged that. Uh, uh, Jake Schoonover, our, our special teams coordinator, um, right away in May, we, we started to do some Zoom clinics with different uh, areas, whether it be Wichita, Topeka, the Kansas City Metro, and diff different things like that. So we started to do some out outreach, um, getting our camps kicked off and doing things, obviously, Sometimes paperwork slows it down at the beginning of June. We, you know, our camp started off maybe a little bit on the slower side, had another one in July, was one of the largest camps we've had here for individual players. So I think we're needing it. But, you know, just like anything, it, it, it'll go by your actions. You know, the, you know are, are you doing a great job evaluating the players in, in the local area? Are you getting out to visit with the coaches? And, and I don't know what year that'll be, RJ, that, that we, we get that, but I know if, if, if coaches and young men take a chance to, to get to know us, I, I think they're going to find out a lot about us. I, I go back to a lot of years of sitting down with families at the end of a recruiting visit and, and ask them what questions. And, and, you know, it always comes back, no coach, your staff does an outstanding job. They're very thorough. They're very honest. They're, you know, they're genuine. And I guess when, you know, as a parent also of someone in college, I think those are the words I would like to have resonate, uh, you know, when I sit through and I try to see it that way as well. And I, and I hope our local players are going to see that as well. They also have a great opportunity to be a part of something special, of, of putting a foundation together and, and turning this program around and putting it into a consistent winning program. A lot of times, it, and it takes a special guy. So, you know, some people go, you can go to some of the powerhouses all the time. You'll be just another of the great ones that play there. And that's fine too. But sometimes it's going to take a little special, take a, maybe a small leap of faith to have belief that you can truly be part of a foundation and be a difference maker at the same time. Kansas Jayhawks coach Lance Leipold took Jared Patterson, offered him a gray shirt, got him to Buffalo, got a thousand yard rushing season out of him in six games, 19 TDs, Eight in one game, 409 rushing yards in one game. He's playing for the Washington football team. He's done nothing but win everywhere he has gone. Coach, I can't wait to see what you do at Kansas. I'm very excited to see what that program looks like two, three years from now. And I appreciate you joining us here on the number one ranked show. 
I appreciate it, RJ. Thank you very much. I apologize it wasn't in person, but we're going to get that in-person meeting in, in pretty soon. And I look forward to having a chance to do this with you again sometime. Rock chalk. As do I, Coach. I appreciate you. And as I have teased, we out here, I need to welcome in Producer Cat, who has called some responses from this comment that I made on the Twitters before the SEC in Oklahoma and Texas decided to destroy all that we know and love. And the comment that I made was Nebraska and Arkansas would have more fun in the Big 12. Again, y'all had takes on my take. So, Producer Cat, what were some of the best as you see it? Let's start with our friend Josh, mm. who said, I agree with Nebraska, but I think Arkansas belongs in the SEC. They've shown in the past they can hang when they have competent coaching. No, they haven't. I, I mean, I guess what you're saying here is that Bobby Petrino had a, like a really good 2011. And at one point we could talk about the SEC West. I think having three out of the top five programs in the country. And I think one of those was even like Ole Miss. But the way that I couch this is Arkansas has never won the SEC championship. Never. They've been in that league for 30 years. The last time they won a championship, Ken Hatfield was head coach in 1989. And Arkansas has one national title and one unclaimed. So I guess you could give them two if that's what you really want to do. But since we're not in the business of giving you titles you don't claim, we're going to stick with one here. And that was when Coach Broyles was the head coach. Okay, Coach Broyles has his own award for assistant coaches now. It's really highly coveted. So could Nebraska hang in the SEC? No. Like, like, ugh. No. <laughs> like, if you, we're talking about Nebraska just trying to put on a good show against Oklahoma to celebrate the game of the century's 50th anniversary. Okay? All right. Arkansas and Nebraska would have so much more fun in the Big 12, especially now that Two of the best teams in it are deciding to leave. I should also add, Producer Cat refused to let me see any of your responses. So I'm coming with these things off the top of my head. That's intentional. I want your first reaction. You can't plan what you're going to say. So this is from Nathan. He says, they would be competing for second place in the Big 12 instead of being bottom feeders in their conferences right now. That's the point. Yeah, that's the point. You'd have more fun. It's kind of like Central Florida in the American, okay? Central Florida moves to the SEC, might be middle of the road, might jump up and bite somebody every now and again, kind of like an Ole Miss, right? Kind of like South Carolina, perhaps. Even A&M, right? I keep picking on A&M because A&M fans seem to think very highly of themselves and have not won a national title since, you know, before World War II in 1939. Okay, couldn't win the Southwest Conference, couldn't win the Big 12, can't win in the SEC. But if they were a part of the American, they'd probably be having the same kind of fun that Central Florida is, which is stomping mud holes in people and walking it dry and getting to claim national championships in 2017. Matter of fact, Central Florida has become one of the most hated programs in all of college football, and I'm here for it because all they did was run the table undefeated and say, hey, we beat everybody on the schedule and we asked to play Alabama. We asked to play Georgia. We asked to play Oklahoma. Y'all wouldn't let us in. So we're just going to take our banner and we're going to hang it. I'm with that. I think that that is the kind of space that Arkansas would like to be in because the thing that Arkansas and Nebraska have going for them is that they are the pro teams in their state. And I submit to you, everybody feels better about finishing in a Big 12 championship game than they do about getting sunned on in the Big Ten West and getting sunned on in the SEC West, okay? Nobody wants to be anybody's son. Everybody wants to be a parent. Be a parent in the Big 12. You're going to stay a son in the SEC in the Big Ten. Produce Scott, what else you got? Last one is from Taylor. Hmm. We really only struggle with football in the SEC. Pretty dominant across the board other than that. Although it would be cool playing new teams, I feel like our football program could be headed in the right direction. You want to be the best, compete, and beat the best. Is this, is this an Arkansas fan? 
This must be an Arkansas fan. It's got to be an Arkansas fan. Okay. Just ma I'm making sure because I don't want to direct my energies at Nebraska and it ain't Nebraska that is coming in here with this wildly ridiculous, stupidly take. Like, ridiculously stupid. Okay. We're good in everything but the sport that everybody cares about. Wait a second. I'm not checking for water polo at Arkansas. Hell, I'm a track nerd, and I'm not even trekking for track at Arkansas, and Arkansas has one hell of a track and field program. What are you talking about? You, like, all right, let me put it another way. Texas has a women's athletic director and a men's athletic director. That's how large their athletic offerings are. And they seem to make that work in the Big 12 just fine, okay? It's one of the reasons they're attractive to the SEC. You could come over, play Texas Christian in baseball, Baylor in baseball, add Dallas Baptist to the Big 12 Baseball Alliance, if you will, have a good time, go play in College World Series. But it feels like since y'all had, had a little bit of success here recently, that people from, uh, remember Andrew Benatendi coming out of there, that you feel like somehow getting beat up by a Vanderbilt is something to crow about. Vanderbilt is really good at these sports you claim you're also good at. Guess what people are sunning on Vanderbilt about 24-7, 365. They're trash football. Now, move Vanderbilt to another conference. And by another conference, I mean outside of the Power Five. They probably have a good time. They probably have a good time in the Mountain West. They probably have a good time in the American. They probably have a good time in the WAC. But in the SEC, you're counting nine losses, okay? I like Coach Pittman. I like Arkansas football. It's why I am saying y'all would have more fun in the Big 12. I'm not even saying y'all don't need to be playing Power Five football. I am saying you need to play in a conference where you are going to have the talent to compete for a championship, okay? As much as people want to dog Oklahoma for how it has played in the college football playoff, I submit to you, I'm having a damn good time running up one, two, three, four, five, six national, or excuse me, Big 12 championships in a row, and one, two, three, out of five, four out of five college football playoffs here. Let's see, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2015. Four out of six, right? That's fun to me. Winning 12 games a year is fun to me. Having Texas be the toughest game on the schedule outside of whoever it is that we schedule in the non-conference is fun to me. Nebraska just ain't keeping up their end this year. Like, I really wanted them to be good. But for you to come out here and tell me that you care more about your program's winning let's say men's basketball championships, which is the second best uh, sport. I would also look to you and say, when's the last time y'all won a, an SEC championship in basketball? Since y'all are so good at these other sports. Volleyball? Track and field. Yeah, I mean, I can keep going here. You know, Florida has Florida relays. Louis, LSU, LSU destroyed, destroyed the men's track and field championships this year. Where was Arkansas? Just saying. If you go come at me, come at me correct. That's, that's all I'm doing. I'm trying to help you. I'm on your side, Arkansas. I'm on your side, Nebraska. I want y'all to be fun. I want y'all to have fun. But you apparently care more about money than winning. And this is the part that, Kat, let me, let me ask this as a Tennessee fan. I mean this. And I'm, I'm being sincere. Do you care how much money the University of Tennessee brings in from its partnership with the SEC? No. What do you care about when you cared about Tennessee before you quit that drug? Going better than six and six. Winning, right? I, just, like, I get to claim winning. Like, one of the things that is a reoccurring theme on this show is 2015 OU Tennessee for obvious reasons, right? That's where I, as a fan, get my credit. And see, this, this is this. You can't see Cat's face, but you should see Cat's face because she, like, knowing she's gonna bring in more money than Oklahoma from their contract, it's not gonna make her feel any better about losing to Oklahoma in 2015. It's not gonna happen, right? That's my point here. 
I approach this first being a fan of the sport and being a fan of my team. I'm also not an idiot about my team, and I'm not an idiot about yours. I'm a realist, okay? Realistically, you will have more fun in the Big 12 than you would in the Big 10 if you're in Nebraska, than you would if you are SEC, if you're Arkansas, even as you'll bring in more money. That's all I'm saying. So when y'all vote the money, I wonder if y'all are fans at all. It's kind of like basketball nerds. Do y'all like the game, or do y'all like talking about what the numbers say about the game? Because I'm here to watch, you know, Olympians. Just back to my previous point. You're good enough or you're not. If you're not, find out where you fit in. Find out what you're good at. You know? Be a specialist. It's fine. It's okay. All right. Now, Produce Cat had me do a very cool thing where we stood in studio in Los Angeles and we made some lists. And the first one that I want to show you today is my top five breakout candidates for 2021. Shout out the interactive board. Let's go. Let's talk about my top five breakout stars heading into this 2021 season. I love this stuff because there are those of you, sure, you will know some of these guys, but there are a lot of you who are going to know all of them by the end of the season. All right, let's get started with number five, Travion Henderson. All right, this one is going to be controversial for some. Why is it going to be controversial for some? Because this is not going to be the starting tailback at Ohio State. Not to start the season, at least. That's going to be Master Teague's job. But it also shows the depth of what they have at Ohio State. When you have a guy like Travion Henderson, a National Gatorade, or not National, excuse me, Virginia Gatorade Player of the Year, 2019. 1,989 yards rushing, okay? Averaged 12.7 yards per carry. And everything was a house call. Like, hey, that's, that's all this man was doing. You're going to see number 32 in the scarlet and gray going in, in 2021, and possibly 2022, 2023, and then we'll see, because he's just that good. Number four, DJ Ui Ungalale. Look, I love me some DJ. Six foot five, about 250 pounds, got an arm like a cannon, and he has shown what kind of heart he has. When Trevor Lawrence went down last year, against Boston College, out due to COVID. They started the true freshman quarterback that is DJ Ui Ungalale, and he brought them back from 18 points down against Boston College to a victory with over 300 yards through the air. He had to do it again against Notre Dame in South Bend, went for 439 yards against a college football playoff team. They lose that game in overtime, but he acquitted himself so well, there's not a quarterback competition in Clemson right now. And he's going to follow up Trevor Lawrence, who is one of the great college football players of all time, and he might be more talented. All right, number three, B. John Robinson. I love me some B. John. Like, I got to see B. John at Big 12 Media Day, and B. John coming in there with this polo where he busted out of this polo, you know what I mean? but he's also an outstanding young man. You're going to have a lot of fun rooting for him. But the reason that he is here is because he is nasty on a football field. All right, this man carried the ball 86 times for 703 yards. Quick math, 8.2 yards per carry. And in the Alamo Bowl against Colorado, they only handed him the ball 10 times. He went for 183 rushing yards in that game. I think of him the same way that I think of 2017 Rodney Anderson, for those of y'all that can get that deep cut, because the second half of the season at Texas was his, and I have told Steve Sarkeesian to his face, I don't see how you're not just going to hand the ball to this man 400 times in 2021 and not call it good. He has that kind of talent. At number two, Bryce Young. Okay, this was always the heir apparent to Tua Tonga Valoa. Mac Jones comes in when Tua gets hurt, shows he can do it. Keep that man on the bench. But this is a five-star quarterback coming out of modern day. He chose Alabama after first having committed to USC. He wanted to go play for Steve Sarkeesian. He's going to play for Bill O'Brien. We'll see how that fits. But there is all the world on this man's shoulders, and I think he is built to do it. You're going to see the next great Alabama quarterback in 2021, and that is Bryce Young, and as Uncle Ruckus would say, no relation. Number one, C.J. Stroud, perhaps the most controversial pick on my top five breakout stars. I am going ahead and telling you, I believe 
C.J. Stroud is going to be the starting quarterback for the Ohio State Buckeyes. If it's not, and it's Jack Miller or it's Kyle McCourt, they're still going to be in great hands. But this man was ranked the 860th best player in the country in February of 2019. By August of 2020, he was ranked number 42 in the country. He did that by going on the camp circuit, going to regionals, beating out other quarterbacks until he gets to the opening final, wins Elite 11 MVP. And now, after a year, watching Justin Fields do his thing, he is in a three-horse battle with Kyle McCord, Jack Miller, for the starting job. The thing that is going to scare you about C.J. Stroud, though, is he didn't throw a pass at all in 2020. It's not the way that Ryan Day would have drawn it up. But he has the frame of Justin Fields. He's got the arm talent of Justin Fields. He's got the moxie of Justin Fields. I want to see that man get an opportunity to lead the Buckeyes. And if he's the guy, he's hopping right into an F1 race car. They are built to win a national championship if they have the right pilot in the driver's seat. And I think CJ is that guy. Go get him, brother. All right, Travion Henderson, DJ Uwe Ungalale, B. John Robinson, Bryce Young, and CJ Stroud. Those are my top five breakout stars. So that's gonna do it for the number one ranked show. Yes, I have CJ Stroud at the top of my breakout candidates list. I believe in him. I know his story. I love his story. I think he's going to end up being Ohio State starting quarterback. But you'll be here to tell me if that is no longer true. My tremendous thanks to Coach Lance Leifold, who was very open and honest and gracious with his time in answering our questions about Kansas football and what he expects for that program going forward. I would bet on them in the next two, three years to absolutely surprise you. Again, producer Cat, Cat Donnelly produces the show. Chris Cheshire directs the show. Jay Beyond Duncan is our social media maven slash manager. Kristen Dunk, or excuse me, Kristen Duncan. Kristen Hurley is our <laughs> executive producer. Jay Beyond, you see what I tried to do there? I don't, I don't think Sean would like that. I host the show. Thank you so much. Please let us know what you like, what you don't like. At number one ranked show, wherever it is that you get your social media news, whether it be Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, we are always there and we are always listening. That's it for me. Deuces. What's up, kid folk? It's RJ Young. I am the host of the number one ranked show here on Fox Sports, and I need you to subscribe to the podcast, wherever it is you get your podcast. And since you are there, please take a look around. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. We're all ears. This is college football all the time, 24-7, 365. And it's right there wherever it is you get your